The European Central Bank has just unveiled their plan to introduce a digital euro that will complement the physical euro. So I figured let's just go to the source and ask the ECB to highlight everything that we should know about it. Specifically, I asked the program director of the Digital Euro Project, Evelyn Whitlocks, questions like why do we need a digital euro? Um, what does the digital euro look like from the perspective of an ordinary citizen? How will it reshape the financial industry? And finally, I asked her about various controversial aspects of the digital euro, such as privacy, um, whether it will replace cash and whether it will be programmable. But before getting into that, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to The Daily Upside for making this video possible. The Daily Upside is a free email newsletter written by a team of experienced financial journalists with the goal of providing clarity and context on the world of business. Whether you are a financial professional or just looking to get a jump start on the news, moving the markets, I can definitely recommend checking out the Daily Upside. It's totally free to sign up and they send you a one information filled email every morning. Find out why over 1 million business leaders read the Daily Upside. You can simply sign up by using the link in the description below. And now, without further ado, here's my full interview with Evelyn Whitlocks at the European Central Bank. So, Evelyn, uh, welcome uh, to the Money & Macro channel. Uh, you're here to talk about the digital euro. Uh, now, when talking about uh, money, people tend to think uh, about this thing over here, the euro, issued by your institution, the, the European Central Bank. But I think what less people know uh, is that this type of money, a bank card, is nowadays the type of money that most people use, actually, way more than, than cash. Uh, and so I also think that most people are fairly happy with this arrangement. And so I thought it would be interesting to, you know, when exploring the digital euro, talk about first, what's the problem? Like, we have cash, we have digital private bank money, why do we need a digital euro? Thank you, thank you. And thank you for inviting me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so maybe first it's good to, to explain a bit about the difference between the two things that you showed, because uh, uh, the bank note is what we call central bank money. It's your claim against the central bank, against the ECB uh, uh, in this case. Yes. When you have, uh, uh, when you do your payments with your card, normally you have put your money at a bank or a payment institution, and you have a claim against that institution. So there's a difference. And of course, this bank has money at the central bank, so there's central bank money behind. Yeah. But there's a difference between the two. Uh, and even though you, you don't always think about it, you trust that the two are uh, interchangeable. Uh, and the fact that you put your money at the bank, you, you never think about this more, or you're not concerned about this, you do all your payments with the, with the card. But it's also partly due to the fact that you know that if you want, you can go to the ATM and you can have a bank note again, and vice versa. So what we see is, is that uh, the way people start to pay is changing. And it differs per, per country in mm -hmm. Europe. Yep. So um, um, uh, from the Netherlands, uh, we are, I'm from the Netherlands originally, um, one in, in every five payments is only still cash. All the rest we do digitally. If you look to Austria, it's the completely the opposite. There's still a lot of uh, being paid with cash. But what we see overall in Europe is, is that the uh, a preference to start to pay with digital uh, means of payment, so like a card or with your mobile watch or your mobile phone, uh, is gaining traction. So where first 72% uh, of the transactions were done uh, with cash, in three years time this moved to 59. And if we ask people what would be their preference to pay, then it's, it's more than half that people say, I would prefer to pay digitally. So we see changing uh, uh, consumer behaviors, I would say. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's the people that, that is, say that they want to start using something else. So let's, let us now fast, so the, the simple answer to your question would be, okay, we have these two types of money like you showed, 
But this one is, is a physical one and it's there for ages and it worked for ages and as a, as a central bank we stay committed to it. We even have now uh, um, uh, an inventory for a new uh, design of the, the, of the cash. So we're still yeah. con connected to this. But everything is digitalizing. So why wouldn't we digitalize cash? So that's the, the simple uh, uh, answer. So it's, it's to prepare our central bank money for the future. Because uh, money is a, is a public good, right? And yes. my parents paid mostly with central bank money. Yes. So they paid mostly with uh, public money. Yeah. I pay most, I'm also from the Netherlands, I pay mostly with uh, digital private bank money. Yes. And there's no public alternative for that. Not uh, digitally, no. And that, that's what you're saying, okay, here we are just adjusting with the times. Yes, we're adding an option. Mm. So if we would fast forward and the current decline of the usage of cash, so this is not us not wanting to, prov uh, to, to provide it, but people using it less, uh, we believe that this access to central bank money, this, 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 this uh, balance that we have found between the two, is good to keep and to keep this option uh, also for the future, indeed. But um, why is it good? Because um, I can get behind it, you know, like, okay, having a public good is, is good. You know, like, just like water is, is, is most often, you know, done by the government. But, and most people, I think, accept that. Like, hey, okay, money should, uh, some, some part of it should be public, at least for cash, it's, you know, there's no controversy about it at all that the central bank does that and private banks don't. But now, um, you know, we have this system. This is how it evolved. And what I'm missing a little bit in your answer still is, you know, what's the advantage then? Like, why not keep it that way? Or what's the advantage or what are the risks for having our digital payment system being dominated by private parties? Well, dominated is still okay, but you could go to a, a scenario where there's no other alternative. Uh, and that we believe it's important that we keep having this choice. So now you have a choice, so either you pay with cash or you pay with a card or a mobile phone or whatever. And we believe towards the future it's important that you keep having this option to pay with uh, uh, digital cash. Um, and um, it, as, as you say, payments is something you don't think about a lot. I do because I, I work in payments for all my life, but in, in general people don't think about payments. You just do payment and it just needs to work. And you trust that it works. And in that sense it's similar to water, to electricity. It's not something you think about a lot, but it, because it's a hygiene factor, you expect that it's there and that it's working. Um, and since it's so important for, for society at large, if you have an interruption in digital uh, payments, uh, then it's in the eight o'clock news. I mean, it's, it's really quite quickly disruptive. So we believe it's good that towards the future, we make sure that there is always this public option. And then it's for the end users to what to use, if they want to use cash or that they want to use private means of payments, or that they prefer to have uh, 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 the digital euro, which is a public good. Mm -hmm. And then last but not least, I think um, payments should be there for everybody, also in a digital age. So since uh, the, if the digital euro would be there, uh, we would make sure, like we do for banknotes, that it's, it's widely accessible and widely usable also for people that are uh, less financially included, uh, included sorry, or less financially digitally included. So we really think it's important uh, that the digital euro as a public good also takes care of them. So what I heard in that answer is two points. Security. So um, depending on a private party, if something happens, you know, there's no other option. The payment system is gone. If we live in a world where the digital euro is there, the backup is a digital euro. That's an advantage. Yes. So there's security, na national security, I guess, or payment security. And then Financial inclusion is uh, the second argument I heard, right? Some people, you know, I've noticed this myself at some point I lived in South Africa. To open a bank account in a foreign country uh, is very difficult. It's very tricky. It takes a long time. And so for a while I didn't have a bank account there. And that is, you know, that makes your life very difficult. And but OK, I, for me, you know, getting a bank account is not so difficult. But here, even in Europe, there are people who find it difficult either to open a bank account, I guess, 
or to maybe maintain it or and so you're saying hey for these people there's also the public option and it should be i guess then easier accessible than a private bank account yeah that's one part so it, it, it's for the par people that are, are not easily getting access via via bank um, but it also that we will pay extra uh, attention for uh, people that are more digitally and financially excluded uh, also in the design of the digital euro so we are it's a public good we're not for profit so we can really make sure that it's very simple to use that have it has also caters for people with disabilities and these kind of things uh, which is coming very natural for from for something that's a public good less natural i don't say that they don't do it but it's less natural for a commercially driven uh, company Okay, oh yeah, because I was, you know, when you first said this, like, oh, we can make it easier as a product, as a public provider, sort of the economist and me started thinking, hey, wait a minute, markets should solve that. But actually you're saying, yes, markets solve that for a broad population, but not maybe for all sort of more vulnerable people yes. for whom it's more difficult to make a profit as a private entity yeah. and as a public uh, yeah. entity you're concerned. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, the fact that if you have something for the whole of Europe, so let's let's say, so one of the, you, we'll come to that probably, but one of the ways we think that the digital euro could be provided is via a digital euro app, mm -hmm. which will be provided by, by the euro system. Um, and then we can also make sure that I mean, it, it, it uh, has all kinds of features for, for example, uh, certain disabled people. Um, it also makes it more efficient because then, uh, because in every country you have, we have a couple of them, but if you group them in the whole of Europe, it's still a, a significant uh, uh, part of the population of which you can create something really good. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's it. One thing that I would like to ask, add to the aspect that you t mentioned on security, uh, one thing that we have not touched upon a lot is is that um, uh, for our payments, which we just uh, established is uh, like crucial, like water and electricity for society, uh, is that we are currently very dependent on non-European players. So 72% of uh, uh, our payments flow through networks which are not European. Um, and that's Visa and Mastercard mostly, or yeah, not only, but uh, the, it, it's uh, those are one of the two uh, big ones uh, indeed. Uh, and we believe that uh, towards the future, it's important that we also have real pan-European uh, uh, network. So we have in certain countries. Uh, uh, domestic solution so uh, in the Netherlands we have ideal in in Spain they have bizum so there there it, I don't we don't say there are not national solutions but that's not a pan european solution that you can e use everywhere in the eurozone yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, um, well in, in the current time and age it's important that we also have uh, something pan european there so yeah okay so it makes sense um, payments is a public infrastructure or like it's maybe done by private parties, but it's a, like, a national interest, yes. basically, right? And it's dominated by American groups at the moment. Um, the geopolitical landscape is shifting. Maybe it's good as Europe to at least have our own crucial infrastructure in order. And with this, we can possibly do that. And indeed, like, I actually noticed this because I'm, I moved to Belgium. So I live in Belgium. And there they also have, this is called Payconic. Uh, that's like similar to Ideal. And, or it's an alternative to Visa and MasterCard. And it's, most merchants use it because I think the fees are lower than with Visa and MasterCard. But I found it very uh, frustrating moving across a border between these small countries that I was excluded from a lot of stuff. Like, for example, the OV chip card. Um, that's uh, the, the public uh, public transportation pass only works via Ideal, but not via Payconic. Similarly, you know, if friends want to send each other money in the Netherlands, we do it with an app called Tiki, and that uses Ideal. But I couldn't use it anymore. You know, living yeah. in Belgium, in the European Union, and so this could potentially solve that issue because then yes. um, I can just use the digital euro. Yes, yes. We 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 also think that it's really strange that we have uh, a currency which in banknotes, in cash, fiscal money, we have something that you can use everywhere, but digitally we don't have something that works everywhere in all use cases. And uh, I think you give a couple of examples. I experienced the same moving from the Netherlands to Germany, uh, is that uh, uh, 
certain payment methods were not accepted here, uh, and if we with some European colleagues want to share the bill, it's impossible. Then the only way to do it is with cash. Uh, yeah. So indeed, the digital euro will be designed uh, that it's uh, really uh, both for peer-to-peer -peer payments, so if we want to pay each other, uh, or in, in shop, so either a physical shop or uh, an online shop, that you can use the payment methods everywhere in the Eurozone, and it's everywhere accepted. Uh, and uh, that, that really uh, adds to everyday convenience of everybody. Yeah, okay, okay. So for me, you know, this sounds like, okay, maybe at least, you know, talking to other people, I don't hear them take this perspective too often. I don't, because how I, you know, interpret this, you know, from our conversation, but also from reading about the digital euro before is, the digital euro is, for a large part, a public alternative to Visa and MasterCard. Um, is that somewhat right? I know it's more, but I, I think that is, or let me put it like this, is that a, a part of the discussion, or is that the, a part of the narrative that, that's not talked about so much, yeah. like a bit misunderstood? Yeah. Well, we're not, not specifically uh, against any of, of the private means of payment, but we find it important indeed that there is a public alternative next to commercial alternative that there are, uh, and that that's really a pan-European uh, uh, solution. Yeah. Uh, and, okay. uh, uh, and, and that's indeed the, the biggest driver for, for the digital euro. Okay, so I want to talk about that a little bit next, uh, sort of from a little bit more from our, from my personal perspective, not my personal perspective, but a personal perspective, sort of what might change if the digital euro is introduced, because it's not certain that it will be introduced. And then maybe a little bit of, about the systemic perspective, because, uh, okay, we've talked about Visa and MasterCard, we can talk about the banks. There is a payment system, and the digital euro will likely uh, make a big impact on that. Uh, some you know, banks might be worried that they're going to lose business. Uh, maybe a visa is worried that they're going to lose business. Maybe some people are happy that they will lose business. So, but it has probably big implications, and I, I know you thought about this a lot. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what I would want to do after, after that. Um, so first, you know, I know we talked a little bit already about this little card over here. Um, how might this change for me? Like if I want to start paying in a shop with a digital euro, um, how does it work? Do I get a, a new card from my bank? Do I get a new card from the European Central Bank? Do I get a virtual card from the European Central Bank? How can I do this in a physical shop? And then, then I want to talk about the online payments. Yeah. But now before you can start paying with the digital euro, you need to go to a payment service provider, quite often the bank. So, mm -hmm. uh, and um, if we look to the current, there's a legislation in, in progress uh, for, for the digital euro. So in that proposal, it says that uh, every payment service provider, so every bank should also provide access to the digital euro uh, uh, there. So in that sense, it would be rather easy. So you would go to your bank and you would say, listen, I also want to have a digital euro account. So that, that's where it starts. Uh, and, si and since this bank already knows you, there's no additional information that needs to be shared. So this, oh, this, this uh, digital euro account can just be opened. Then you need to make sure that you have digital euros. Um, uh, and that you can do in two ways. So either you bring cash, Mm -hmm. and then you put cash is transformed into digital euros on your account. Yeah. Or you connect it to a bank account that you already have, and you say, I want to fund my digital euro account with, let's say, 50 euros. And then 50 euros is taken off your bank account, and you have 50 digital euros on, on your digital euro holding. So then you're all set to go. Um, and then um, there are actually indeed two ways that uh, um, you can make use of the digital euro. So either via an app, mm -hmm. and the app can be on your laptop or your, your desktop, uh, on your mobile phone, even on your smartwatch. So you can, uh, um, and, there, and there you have, a, or a card. And then uh, for, for, the, for the digital uh, wallet, there would be two options. So um, either your bank provides it in the current wallet that you already have, so there's just an additional option uh, uh, in your wallet, or uh, the European uh, uh, Euro system will issue a digital euro 
app, which you can download, and that is specifically dedicated to uh, the Digital Euro. Uh, and there you can manage all your Digital Euro accounts and do payments from there. So it's your choice. So either you use the one from you get from your bank, if your bank provides it, or you, you use the uh, standalone uh, app. And then these two you can uh, can use in the in the shop, uh, and the own card uh, will be a contactless payment, like you you know uh, now. Can also be with with smart smartwatch. We're also still looking into other options, so maybe with the QR code. Mm, yeah. uh, but mm. this is a, a part of the technical uh, exploration we still need to do in the coming years. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because that uh, I know as well. Like this is not so. It differs per country. Some countries yeah. already have this, right? Like, I know in I when I moved to Belgium, I learned like there's this Payconic app. The the shop gives me a QR code. I can and then I can do that with the digital euro app. Yes. Uh, and the other option is, I maybe still have my my private bank card, but it doesn't say Visa here. It says uh, digital euro. Yes. And then uh, yeah. it happens automatically yeah. via digital euro yeah. from there on out. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then. Uh, but, you know, I, I like online shopping. Uh, I never need my card for that, uh, or not per se. Uh, then I could imagine now I go to my online store, let's say it's Amazon. Uh, it now gives me always payment options. It says, okay, uh, in, in Belgium, do you want to use Payconic? Uh, do you want to use Visa or MasterCard? I suspect these are typically lower because they're more expensive for the merchant. Uh, do you want to use PayPal? It's another one, I think, right? And then it will say, do you want to use the digital euro? Is that how it, what it might look like for a yeah, consumer? We might also be on top, but uh, yeah. uh, no, that, that's uh, uh, not a given. But indeed, mm. the digital euro would be an, a payment option. Um, so you would see uh, digital euro, and then you could click and say, "I want to pay with the digital euro," and that activates uh, uh, then in the payment. And then the, it could be two forms. So either again with a, a QR code. Or uh, with um, uh, a pay by link, um, but yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. but okay. you will really yeah. see, and that's actually the same in the shop. You will always see I pay with a digital euro. Yeah. And then, but from my perspective, from the user, um, it doesn't matter too much. I would maybe the convenience, but the costs would be the same, right? Like also for me, if I whether I pay with Payconic, Ideal, or uh, Visa or Mastercard, to me the cost is the same. But behind the scenes, for the merchants, the the costs are very different, right? Like I think uh, Mastercard charges relatively more, for example. Yeah, yeah. We we could <coughs> so uh, I mean, it's difficult to say how uh, uh, payments uh, will de uh, mm -hmm. develop over time and what will be charged. So we have nothing to say on what will be charged on private solutions. But for the digital euros, we have said it would be should be free for basic use, which is doing these pay payments like we just uh, described uh, for free. So that's what we what we promise for the actually. user, right? For for the, yeah for the payer, the yeah, one that yeah, wants yeah. to pay. Yeah. Uh, on the accepting side, on the merchant side, so if we pay to each mm -hmm. other, the other one that gets paid doesn't need to pay as, uh, either. So this is uh, all free. Uh, and then, uh, but if you would go to a shop, a merchant would pay a fee, like he, he currently does. And we believe uh, uh, that with the digital euro, this could be a very competitive uh, uh, fee, uh, because uh, we, we, yeah, we, and 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 secondly. Because there is the alternative, uh, which is a pan-European, widely accessible and widely usable alternative, we think it also helps to keep the costs that are charged in general uh, mm -hmm. down. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, payments, is a, it's a network pro uh, product. So if you are a big uh, there is, and, and there's not a lot of competition, there's always the risk that you start overcharging. Um, but with ha with having this pan-European solution as an alternative there, uh, we believe it also maintains or ensures uh, competitiveness and effectiveness and therefore low prices in the market overall. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. if, uh, let's say, the digital euro is introduced and almost nobody uses it, but it keeps the fees from the private providers down, it keeps the private providers on their toes, you're also happy. 
Yes, we, we, what, what we find most important is that there, that there is this choice. So that's also not why we have said it needs to have so, so much adoption or whatever in order to be a success. It's important that there is this choice and that the people can make this choice. Having said that, it is important for a, any payment solution in order to, to achieve the, the goals, but uh, is that it's used regularly by a certain amount of people. So if nobody uses it ever, mm -hmm. it can also not work as a backup because mm -hmm. if you have not downloaded the app already uh, and uh, put some digital euros in times of crisis, you cannot use it. So we, we do find it important that we make it attractive and that people want to either use it and accept it. Um, but the most important thing is, is that there is this choice. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But uh, you say we find it important that people accept it, but people will have to accept it, right? It's uh, by law a degree just as it that I have to accept cash. Because that's legal tender. Yeah, in the, in the current, so this is this is not going to be determined by the ECB, mm -hmm. but in the uh, draft legislation, which is published published by the European Commission, they have indeed proposed that every merchant that currently accepts digital means of payments also need to accept digital euro. So that would mean that if you are a bakery, a small bakery somewhere, and you only accept cash, you are not under this ob ob uh, obligation. But if you accept any digital means of payment, you also need to in, uh, uh, accept a digital euro. Yeah. But we need to see, of course, what ends up in the final proposal, but this is currently in the draft legislation. Yeah, yeah. and if the proposal works, then I want to do that anyway, because the digital euro is hopefully a better product yes. from a merchant's perspective, yes. right? Yes, we have... A, um, uh, we do a lot of interaction with the stakeholders in the market, amongst which the consumer organization, but also the merchant organizations. And they are very supportive of the digital euro. Uh, so we do expect indeed that they would want to uh, accept the digital euro. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because they, probably because they think at least they'll have to pay fewer fees. Well, I think that they very good uh, understand that it's good that there are sufficient choices uh, uh, in the market and that that keeps our all... Uh, all players in the market on their toes. Yeah, okay. So, okay, I think I get it in the sense that, you know, from my perspective, it's just another, like, it doesn't have to do anything with cash. It's just another digital alternative for me, for my Visa card, for my MasterCard, for my PayPal account, which I still sometimes use, even though I hate it uh, because they charge ridiculously high fees, but, um, and my, in my case, Payconic, and for my Dutch friends, ideal. It's just an alternative to that, and um, it might keep the private sector on their toes or it might be a better product for some. And then it's just more choice. Yeah. yeah. Can I add one thing that we have not touched upon? Because this is the, the, the digital euro, the online version. Mm -hmm. uh, what I have not uh, touched upon is that we are also uh, designing an offline version. Uh, and that is uh, slightly different. Um, so there the digital euros would be uh, stored on either your phone or on a card, uh, and then we can and we, and you can use it without electricity or without having any reach on the internet. Uh, so that also helps us to increase the uh, resilience uh, of the payment uh, system. Um, and it would mean that let's assume that we both have this, uh, and let's assume that we have it both on our phone. Then I can pay you 20 euros, digital mm -hmm. euros, and by just holding our phones close to each other, we can transport these 20 euros from my phone to your phone. And there's no network in between. So this is a very private way of, of paying as well. So very close to how cash would work. Mm -hmm. So okay. um, especially with the offline uh, digital euro, that will be very, very close. I, I think as close as we can be uh, to... Uh, to, to cash, to digital cash. Because, um, you know, I've been at a festival at some point trying to pay with um, Payconic app. Internet was down, yeah. I couldn't pay. Yes. That, that problem will not happen then? No, will be resolved. Of course, um, if I have a phone I can, and the other person has a phone, I can transfer money to someone. Uh, for that, I do need mobile connection, of course. And that's also just quite a hassle. Yeah. Uh, and that and this is just tap tap phone easier yeah, it, that it, way. Yeah. Yes. So okay. it will be it will be uh, almost as if I give you this ten, 10 euros. Yeah. Uh, 
um, by only by holding the phone. Mm. So we don't need internet, you don't need electricity, you just can pay. Uh, and this is between the two of us, but we will also uh, look uh, that uh, also merchants can accept offline payments. So in this case, uh, uh, you can still buy your beer uh, at this merchant, even though oh, yeah. there's no yeah. internet access. Yeah. yeah, okay, 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 yeah. Yeah, okay, and then there's also like, I mean, this is maybe a small example, but I, you know, sometimes, uh, let's say a bar is very far underground, you know, so yeah. it can give problems uh, for your digital payments and that should be solved then. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 mm. my example is I went hiking with my husband uh, in, in the mountains in Austria and um, I'm in digital payments for ages, so uh, I, I, I only bring digital means of payments, but my husband loves cash. Uh, so he brought quite a no lot of cash and I was sort of laughing, but I know him, so okay, fine, it's good if he wants to bring cash. But I was extremely happy because nowhere in the mountains could we pay with any digital means because there was no internet reach. So we were very happy with cash there uh, and there the offline uh, digital euro would function similarly. Yeah, yeah. okay, yeah, that's good. I, I didn't think about it like that before, yeah. so okay, that's a good um, alternative perspective. So okay, I'm happy you brought up um, you know, the, the giving me back the 10, 10 euros, because maybe you could actually give me back my 10 euros. Uh, so then we can talk about settlement. Yeah, thank you so you. much. <laughs> because now that, that's, that's the difference between cash and digital payments, right? Uh, you, not only did uh, I ask you for my money back, yeah, so we have this promise, uh, the payment was settled, right? Yes. It was settled by us locally. Yes. But if we were to do the same thing with our bank cards, uh, the bank, if we have the same bank, the, that bank settles the payment, I think. Then that means like making sure that indeed my account is increased and your account is decreased. Um, if we don't have the same bank, you know, the payment provider does it, I think. That's how I understand it. But yeah. you know way more about this than, than me. Uh, like Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, uh, right? Yeah. That's how that works. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's a it, it's a bit, but let's say it's a very complex actually. No, uh, but um, indeed, for a digital payment, uh, uh, the settlement is done between the banks, uh, and then at the end of the day, the banks also settle between themselves. So they they make sure. So, for example. With the debit card, you, they do a lot of. Everybody does a lot of transactions during the day, mm -hmm. uh, and then the moment you do the transaction, they they I don't know, they deduct the ten euros from your account. I get the ten euros on my account. But I, I'm, if if in the same bank, the bank can just do it in their own systems. If it's uh, between banks, then there are providers in between that make sure that this messaging is done vice versa. But the real settlement. Let's assume that your bank. Um, receives much more money in total than it has to pay. Yeah. This real settlement is done at the end of the day in the systems of the central bank. Yeah, okay, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. So that's the reserve yeah. payment or, um, yeah. But who does the, um, who does the, the give the information b before the central bank settlement? Is that the Visa MasterCard? Is that what they do? Yeah, yeah. So uh, actually a uh, card <coughs> transaction is a, is a bit complex because uh, it was designed in a way where there was only settlement once a day between banks. Uh, now we have instant payments where the settlement can be done instantly, but that didn't exist when the card system was defined. So what actually happens is the moment you do a card transaction, it's actually only information exchange. So between the two banks, <coughs> they exchange information, they check. So you so suppose you do this transaction, then... <coughs> via your card and the terminal and then some systems in between, they go to your bank and they check, do you have 10 euros? Yes, you have 10 euros. And then they say, okay, deduct the 10 euros. And then uh, the bank, my bank, because you want to pay me the 10 euros, will put 10 euros on top. So you will have 10 less, I will have 10 more. But this is only information exchanged. Only at the end of the day, the, the card companies make a calculation and then they say bank A needs to pay so much to bank B. Mm -hmm. And then the actual settlement is done. Uh, and all this in calculations is done still by, the, by the, the card schemes. And then this results in simple transfer of money from bank A to bank B. 
so in that sense, the card system is the most complex system that there could be actually. Um, but the, the, going back to the digital euro, the digital euro would be looking look be, would look very much the same as if we. So I give you now the ten euros, and then it's settled. Mm -hmm. The moment you accept this, then it's settled. Yeah. I've, it's, I've left my hands, it's your hands, it's moved. With the digital euro, uh, the transaction is going through our systems and we, in, we do the instant settlement as well. So the moment that you pay to me with, with your card or with your phone, it is in our systems and then you really have 10 euros less and I have 10 euros uh, 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 more so it's yeah. instantly settled. The money has moved. Can it? It's also cannot be revoked, uh, like uh, like as if I would have given you a banknote. So that is um, so. The, the the moment we do that, let's say we're we're in Amsterdam, we do that in Amsterdam. Signal is sent here to Frankfurt. Clearing happens, or the settlement happens here in one of the ECB data centers. And that's that's it. Is that how, how that would work? Uh, yeah, the, the, how we technically are going to build it, mm. and whether it's in Frankfurt, and whether it's only one site, probably mm. not. Mm. Most, but you can say it goes to the euro system, and yep. then indeed we, we 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 will settle this instantly. Yeah. So okay. the moment the transaction is done, like with the banknote, mm. the money is moved from me to you. So how okay? So how I see that now is like okay, I, I recognize that's actually different from what the card companies do. But it is uh, a similar service from the user perspective yes. to what uh, the card companies do. Yeah, well, it, there are two differences. Uh, is is that, uh, and some merchants appreciate that. Is is that uh, uh, with a card scheme, they are not paid out instantly. With the digital euro, they get access to the money instantly mm -hmm. because it's instantly settled. Not all merchants appreciate that because it also has something to do with their uh, administration in the back end. But yeah. for some merchants, it's important that, especially if, uh, so this is one. Um, and um, I was lo losing the thread of the, the the second point I wanted to make. Oh yeah, uh, we, we talk about card companies, mm -hmm. um, but we need to, ma to make sure is that there's that you have the debit card, which is uh, a maestro or uh, it, and there, there the digital year would look very much like that. So it's really that. Then also card companies have credit cards, but that's a very different service because actually there you buy on credit. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes that is just a credit of one day or, or one month, um, but it's still a credit uh, transaction. That is not something the digital euro will provide because of the instant settlement as I just explained. Yeah, so yeah. A, a credit card functionality will not be provided by, uh, by the digital euro. Yeah, okay. Okay, so if I'm you know, taking a step back, looking at the, the industry, yeah. um, the payment industry will, will, will be affected by this. Um, they have a new competitor, like if this happens, right? So that, this is how I, how I then see it. Um, but a lot of worries before this um, were about the banking industry, uh, in the sense that, okay, private banks uh, create money uh, as credit, um, and uh, they have it on their balance sheet, and they can get into trouble thanks to cash. Uh, if people don't trust the bank anymore, they will try to convert all of their money into cash, but because maybe because um, cash is less used anymore, at least for a while before the Silicon Valley bank run, I guess, people thought, hey, bank runs are maybe a bit less likely now. Uh, and I think, you know, if I remember, you know, talking about this a few years ago, uh, one of the worries was, hey, we're going to have uh, huge bank runs or at least people, you know, moving into digital euros rather than bank euros. And so then all the banks are going to fail again. But this is a big part of the, of the program, right? You've thought about this a lot, and maybe you can tell us a little bit yeah. more how you're going to you fix that problem. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so we have indeed looked to to the financial stability, as we call it. So it's important that uh, uh, the digital euro will not disrupt uh, all of the sudden uh, uh, the system as it, as it's there. So. Um, for that reason, we, it is proposed that there will be holding limits. So that means that uh, because the digital euro is designed as a means of payment, as I, I said, not as a means of investment. Um, so 
then we have said, okay, if we then could put holding limits, then the amount of money that could move from from the from the balance of the from the banks to the digital euro is limited, and we can also monitor that because we know uh, how many people can hold digital euros. We know the holding limits, so we know the maximum amount of digital euros that are around, and we can then also calculate uh, this and calibrate this in a way that it will not disrupt uh, the, the the system. So this is foreseen. The level of these holding limits we will only de we determine uh, uh, later. Mm -hmm. um, so we have taken into consideration the concerns. Banks were also uh, concerned about being disintermediated. But as I explained, you will go to a bank in order to get a digital euro. So we're not going to take the, 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 the customer contact uh, away. Yeah. So a lot of the con those concerns we have taken into consideration in, in uh, our design, and we, we think it's uh, perfectly possible to have a well-designed digital euro, well-functioning digital euro without disrupting uh, the financial sector. And I want to add something to that, because um, sometimes in, to, in this discussion, it seems like the only thing that is changing in the financial landscape is the digital euro. So there is the current equilibrium and then the digital euro comes and is changing things. But that's not how the world is actually. Uh, uh, the, the financial sector and the payment system as, as uh, specifically is very much into um, uh, in, in change. Mm -hmm. So um, we have uh, big tax coming in very aggressively and very uh, ambitious into uh, into uh, to the space we have uh, uh, new banks uh, uh, stepping up so um, actually uh, we should not look at the digital euro against the current status quo but against everything that's happening and then these new competitors coming in into this landscape uh, some being very powerful uh, um, uh, might be more dis much, much more disruptive than a digital euro. And actually, uh, we believe that um, with the digital euro being uh, embraced by the financial sector, we could actually strengthen the financial sector against these uh, uh, challenges uh, that are, are ahead. Um, yeah, and, and last but not least, um, we're talking about, uh, for example, bank grants, people moving their money. Uh, but people can, we should be aware that people can still uh, withdraw cash, but also, and that has been seen in recent uh, uh, um, incidents, um, you can just uh, do a digital yeah, uh, transfer, transfer yeah. with amounts much higher than any of its holding limit, and then the money is gone from the bank as well. So we believe, yeah. long story short, we believe uh, yes, uh, the digital euro is an, a new component in, in, in the system uh, and it needs to find its place and it needs to find some place. Um, but we don't believe it's hugely disruptive. Um, uh, uh, and secondly, um, we should really look into to this, not with the st current status quo in mind, but much more with the things and the challenges that are ahead of us. Yeah, okay. So yeah, indeed, like, even from a personal perspective, you know, I've noticed um, big shifts. Uh, I have a Revolut account, for example, which one of the new banks helped me out a ton, you know, paying uh, money in, in other European countries that don't use the euro, for example, it's much cheaper. Um, the app was great. And I think it also maybe motivated my bank to upgrade their app. Uh, and of course, I now have my Google wallet, for example, and this is some of the stuff you're talking about, uh, which is coming into the world of finance, disrupting it. And if I heard it correctly, um, you know, uh, maybe there's also a little bit of a geopolitical angle there that a lot of these players that seem to be taking over are not European. Uh, and that, you know, again, uh, brings us back to, hey, do we want to have a core building block of the economy don't, nothing against foreign players, I think, if I interpret it correctly, yeah. but maybe we don't want them to dominate a crucial, that just that you don't want to be completely dependent on Russian gas. <laughs> you don't want to be completely yeah. dependent on American finance. Yes, mm. uh, in, uh, that, that's mm. true. And uh, um, uh, let me add to that is that it, it's not only where they're coming from, but also 
the 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 power that they have. I mean, if you if you if we look to uh, uh, other cases, for example, in opening up uh, the antenna of, of the mobile phone. Um, uh, in the, the case against Apple, that takes years, and we're still debating that with them. Well, not we, the, the Commission is debating that uh, uh, with them. So sometimes companies are so powerful that uh, uh, financial, uh, how do you say it, punishments don't hurt them too much. Um, so it's it's not only where they're coming from, but also the sheer size of of some of the players. Uh, that can give them a lot of power uh, and um, we can regulate everything um, but sometimes that takes years of age and ages uh, sometimes so then it's better to have uh, a public good next to that uh, that you can ensure that the people that don't feel uh, well served by these solutions uh, can also go for this uh, public good yeah okay so for example uh, i have a small regional German bank uh, might actually be quite threatening for me that Google's muscling in uh, with an expensive service that everybody's now using, but hey, now actually the digital euro is always there as a backup because that can always also be the payment mechanism. Uh, and maybe from an individual's perspective also, maybe so, so many people are moving to their Google wallet, but I'm, I'm, a bit, I'm getting older, uh, I have some gray hairs already. Um, now maybe uh, I don't want to get on the Google train, uh, but thanks to this initiative, there's always the backup of the digital euro. There's not just cash. That, that's sort of the, that's, the that's, idea, I that's, guess. That's then. the idea, because uh, maybe it's not only because you have gray, ear, uh, gray hair, sorry, <laughs> uh, but it could also be that uh, in order to, to pay with any of these payment means, uh, they they say you get great service, mm. but you need it's in exchange for your data. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, And you might not want to do this. Well, fine. Mm. It's good that some, but, but then there's always this option uh, and and a choice that you can make. But if you like this payment solution and you don't mind sharing your data, then it's also fine. It's 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 we we're not replacing something. We're adding a choice. So I'm really brought, um, glad that you brought up uh, privacy. Actually, right because. You mention it as uh, sort of a positive for the digital euro, but you know, out of all of the concerns, and there, there, you know, there are uh, quite a lot of concerns, which is, I think, a, a really good thing. And I, I, you know, from what I've seen from your publications, is also something that that has actually helped you to make the digital euro hopefully a better proposal. Um, privacy is one of the big ones, right? Because the idea is. Big government uh, is coming in, uh, and they are now going to have all of my payment information. Um, but you are saying, hey, actually, and like a couple of times already, the digital euro is more private than uh, not cash, but than the private bank solutions and payments that we're we're using. Yeah. Now, how can you comment a little bit on this? Difference between public perception and your perception. Yeah, well, I think there are two angles. Mm. So one is the the end-to-end -end privacy of a solution. So that is that starts from you as a user, and then it flows through the through the banks and through all the, all the systems. Uh, and how private is this end-to-end? -end? Uh, so how much data do I share? Uh, and the other option, and that is more what is addressed with the people that are concerned about with government, is okay somewhere in this chain. There's the euro system, uh, the ECB that will see, it will settle the data. So they will probably see all the all, uh, uh, all this data, and then they want to do all kind of things with that. Um, and but we have designed the digital euro because indeed uh, it has been given back to us as one of the biggest concerns even before we started uh, the investigation phase. So in the in the current design, we have designed the part that the euro system will do. So as we just described, the, the, the payments are started at the banks and then it, it's only settled at the, at the, at the central bank. Uh, so, but that, that part of the, the processing that is done for the transaction within the uh, ECB, uh, we have designed it in a way that we can settle this transaction without knowing who has done these transactions. So um, the, the, the data will be pseudonymized 
zo... Pseudonymized? Pseudonymized. Oh, pseudonymized, oké. Okay, pseudonymized, yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah. 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 Um, Pseudo-anonymized. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, so that, that, we, that we, we know there is a person that does a transaction to this other person, that they, those are two different persons, but we don't know who they are. The only ones that knows are, uh, are the banks, but we don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we are experimenting actually with privacy, privacy-enhancing techniques to make sure that we have as little data uh, uh, in the system uh, as, as is needed, but we already know for sure that we don't need to know who's doing the payment so that we can uh, build it like this. So in that way, the design is already preventing us from being able to see it. So it's not that we say, okay, we see all the data, but we promise you that we don't look at it. Mm-hmm. We will not even have the data in our systems, so we cannot uh, look into that or misuse that in any form. So. I know a lot of people are concerned about that, but this is really at the core of our uh, uh, design. Um, And it's not only us, but we have, for example, the the European uh, Data Protection uh, Authority, and they also, we're in close contact with them, and they also publish reports on that. So they will uh, uh, also uh, carefully look into this, that we won't have that data. yeah, and then so the, the bank does have the, the the data, but that's already the case. Yes, uh, and so about this actually, like someone, um, I asked my community on Money and Macro to comment uh, and see what I should ask you. Yeah. and someone also said there, like, can you maybe ask if they were willing because. You know, this person knew that sort of this was in the proposal. Like you're you're saying, we are not going to save that data here at the ECB. Yeah, the private banks will save it, but that's already the case. Um, and this person said, you know what would really help ma- build trust? If they could make the code open source, uh, the set- settlement code. Let- let's. Is this something you're willing to, to do? Well, we are looking into that, how we could do that. We, so we will for sure uh, uh, make sure that what mm-hmm. the claims that we make, <laughs> on, uh, on, amongst others on privacy, uh, will be uh, audited by uh, independent uh, uh, institution, whether we can also move it to open source code, I, I can't answer yet, but mm-hmm. those, we are looking into that. But we will make sure that it's no, not only us uh, saying it, but we will make sure that it's, it's uh, um, uh, verified by independent uh, uh, authorities. Yeah, okay, okay. So that's, um, yeah, so that's that part. But also, you know, what surprised me about this discussion, because I do know a couple of people who are working at banks. And, you know, actually talking to them, I, I got the impression from them also sort of under pressure from the central banks and the governments, what became way more prominent after all sorts of um, scandals and, and, and stuff like that is sort of, I think, whitewashing regulation. And so nowadays, banks employ a lot of people that monitor transactions um, to see if they are, um, you know, uh, illegal or something, right? Um, but that's already the case. <laughs> that's not something new with the digital euro, I think, right? No. It's, it is, of course, true that cash doesn't have that. Um, uh, and then uh, I also came across someone saying, like, the proposal is... Um, Maybe if we want to have that with the digital euro, we can build in a sort of limit where um, if a transaction is below that, you know, it's ne- never going to be a whitewashing kind of transaction because it's a small transaction. Maybe can we build in something where uh, there's a guarantee that this is like completely anonymous, also on the bank side um, with the digital euro? Uh, is this something uh, that is considered? Well, um, the the on privacy, it's and it's very good that you say it. There is this balance that we, as society, need to find between the the, the right to privacy in one hand and the the ambition that we have to fight uh, terrorism and money laundering uh, capacity. Yeah. The exact balance will be determined by the legislator. So there is a proposal in the in the draft legislation which need to be adopted by the European Parliament, but they will determine what would be the level of privacy. So what you described on the, uh, 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 on the cap is something that technically can be built, um, but currently it's not in the proposal for the commission. Mm-hmm. So, okay. uh, but it, it could be, technically it could be done, but it's really a political decision how much the, this right to privacy versus uh, fighting terrorism and anti-money laundering. Having said that, 
Uh, we've discussed briefly also the offline uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. solution. In the mountains of Austria with my phone. Yeah, and um, uh, there you have a higher level of privacy than you currently have with your online solutions because it doesn't need to be registered. It's only registered in your secure element in your phone or your card. It doesn't go through any, any network, so it's really in that sense very uh, uh, private. And since you are uh, very, you need to be close to each other. So it's very difficult to do large scale fraud if you need to have all the secure elements and constantly being con uh, 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 close to each other. Um, so there, also in the current proposal, the level of uh, highest level of privacy and, and close, uh, sorry, yeah, highest level of privacy and closest to what you can ha have with cash will be with the offline uh, uh, digital euro. And can I then also use that if I am not offline? Uh, no. Yeah. You, yes, you can do it, but you need to make Turn sure off. that you. Yes. <laughs> Allah, okay. Yeah. You, you you need to make sure that you're offline then. So if so it's. So if I want to be really private, uh, you know, l l in a transaction here or something, put my pl um, phone into airplane mode and then I have a more private transaction. Yeah. So we need to see how we are going to design it. But mm -hmm. if you want to do an offline transaction with your mobile phone, because with a card you can always do it. Uh, yeah. Then you need to say, I really want to do an offline transaction. You need to make that uh, clear if you're not offline. And that can be either by a button in the app or by switching off your phone. We need to still uh, see how we can best design that. Uh, but you need to be offline. Otherwise, uh, yeah. you, or you need to make sure that you tell to your phone that you want to do an offline payment. Okay. So um, another concern. Uh, is programmable money. I think this comes from the, the crypto space a little bit, I guess, uh, where they had at least smart contracts, uh, where some something can, can be executed, a payment, if some condition is met. And I think also the Chinese, or at least there were rumors that the Chinese may have been working on some programmable money where it's more like a voucher, I guess, where the government can say, hey, you can, can have this kind of money, but you can only use it for... Um, environmentally friendly purchases. You can only buy electric vehicles with this or, or something like that. Um, that is something that a lot of people are worried about, especially you know, people who, who prefer more freedom, uh, I guess, and, and less interference from, from the government. Um, are these worries justified? No. So we're not going to build programmable money. It's exactly as you said, it would be like uh, the central bank issuing vouchers. Uh, and that's not what we do. So a digital euro will be a digital euro like a banknote uh, is, a, is, is one digital euro. So it's, uh, uh, it, it will remain its, its, uh, its, its uh, value and we will not limit it in any way uh, or of its usage. Uh, so there will be no programmable money. Uh, and actually in the legislation it, is, it already states explicitly uh, I would say on top because uh, um, that the digital euro cannot be programmable money, uh, mm, but it has okay. never been. Uh, 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 it would not be logic uh, for a, a central bank to issue. Uh, that would be like issuing vouchers. So we're not going to do that. I mean, I, I guess it is logic in the sense that maybe in a Chinese situation, I, I do think there. They also, you know, are rumors that they're like. Uh, Connecting it to the social credit system or, or something 1984-ish like. So maybe I, get, I, I just want to say, I, I think the, the concern is very valid. But I, I guess what you're trying to say is, yes, concern is valid. And that's why we're not going to do it. And that's why we put in legislation that we are not going to do it. Yeah, and we have, we have said that we're not going to do it. Uh, so mm. it, it, it's, uh, it, it's uh, good that people uh, uh, question this. Um, but they don't need to be concerned. But we're not going to do it, and even the legislation uh, is not allowing this. Because but we would the, not. Uh, yeah. We also don't have to wish. Uh, just to be very clear. Okay, because the, the um, you know if you if I'm really not trusting you at all, uh, you also cannot do it anymore, right? Like if the legislation is passed by the European Commission, no. uh, then that that is clear what the parts of the digital euro are, and there's nothing you can do to fiddle with that. It's just. Unless some new le legislation is passed, yes, but then I guess people, 
you know, need to protest then uh, against the new legislation. Of course, uh, and uh, um, uh. but the, of course the, the ECB will follow the legislation. We will not do something that is not allowed by uh, by law. And that I think gets us to the final concern, which is the disappearance of cash. Now you've talked about it uh, at the start of the interview. I think you don't want that. You're even designing. You have you're spending thousands of or maybe hopefully not too much money on uh, <laughs> on the new design for a new new euro. Yeah. Uh, why would you do that if yeah. you want to get rid of cash? Um, no, no, we, we, we no, we are we are very committed to cash. Uh, a colleague of mine said. Uh, uh, the cash is our is our baby. I mean, it's our product. It's uh, so we're very proud of cash, and we stay committed to cash. Um, uh, so it's not replacing cash, and people that want to reuse cash we can uh, use cash, and we will. Uh, we are committed to provide cash as long as anybody would ask uh, uh, for it. But we want to put an option next to cash, but it's nothing more than an extra option. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, I think um, that closes off uh, the questions I had about this. Uh, I, I learned a lot about sort of what the idea behind it is, like mostly as an alternative, mostly for me still like a payment alternative, not so much a bank alternative because of the holding limit. Uh, it could make payments for me as a user easier, um, slightly more private uh, and uh, potentially cheaper for small merchants, which is... I hope a uh, good thing. Um, but okay, there are concerns, I guess, by the financial industry. Some of them warranted. This is a disruption in, in payment. It's a new player. Okay, you say it's not the biggest player, which could be true, right? But it's still uh, a, new, are, uh, actually, a new development. Uh, we're only the, ne uh, the only development that says uh, in the, in the, for the banks that comes out and says, listen, we want you to do this together with us. You want to be the distributor. We want to give you a fair compensation. We want to do it to make sure that this is also benefiting yourself. So we really uh, want to do it together with the financial sector and therewith strengthen also the financial sector. So we believe uh, um, that this is something uh, that is for, for the benefit of society, but also uh, could be for the benefit of the banks as well. Okay. Well, I hope so. Um I'm, I'm definitely going to read more about it. I think also, is there, some, is there something people can do to influence this or, you know, if they're against it, block it because, um, or encourage it? Because I think, you know, the merchants uh, are very enthusiastic, for example. So, but then they have to go to the European Commission, I think, right? Like, it's, is there democratic accountability here? Is it, yes, how of can course. Yes, of course. Like so, uh, I, I would say first <coughs> that it would be important um, that they try to inform themselves uh, as much as possible. So on our website, we have uh, uh, very short explainers. We have longer uh, explainers. So if you want to deep dive on certain topics, so I think it's it's really good to to inform yourself. We try to be as uh, open and as clear uh, to to make sure that everybody understands what's currently on the table, and then um, we. Uh, we are also open together with the Commission in consultation. So we did one before the um, investigation phase. The Commission has done a consultation before the legislation was published. Uh, and currently it's in the legislative uh, process. So it's now with the European uh, Parliament. Okay. So in the end, okay. the European Parliament needs to vote uh, uh, and, and or amend uh, uh, the, the legislation. Okay, and then it, it will be a while, right? Like when, if that all happens, two years, three years, when can we expect the digital euro? Yeah, that will depend a bit on the, on the timelines when the legislation will be there. What we are currently doing is, uh, so we just moved to, to a new phase, uh, which we call a preparation phase. So in parallel with the legislative debate, we want to further uh, explore, to further prepare, uh, but also to, to, to learn and experiment more so that we are as ready as possible that at a certain point the legislation would be adopted and it would be decided to issue them, that we can go as quickly as, we, uh, uh, as possible to launch a digital euro. But that would not be within one week uh, after the decision. Okay. Evelyn, thank you so much. Thank you too. Uh, and uh, yeah, I will make a, a movie about this as well uh, next, about central bank digital currencies in general, because there's lots of going on. This was just a digital euro. 
There's lots more to explore about this. Uh, we haven't talked about wholesale digital currencies. We haven't talked about international okay. payments. But maybe we'll have a chance to, to talk about that some other time. You're always welcome. Thank All you right. very much. Thank you.